Welcome to Succession Planning for CRCs, the program that helps you develop and today implement a succession plan. My name's Andrew Huffer and I'd like to welcome along the most magnificent John Denton. Great to have you here again, John. G'day, Andrew. Pleasure to be here as always. Looking forward to a pretty action-packed and fun-filled episode as always. And we're into our final episode of the program, can you believe? As we go along, I think it's worth having a quick recap of where we come from from episode four, where we talked about implementation. We talked about four key areas there. First, we talked about transition strategies for both staff as well as our board members. We also talked about what to do in the case of a sudden departure and what to do with crisis management. What are some of the things that are gonna pop up and give you a bit of a surprise that you're gonna to have to deal with quickly? Linked to that, we, thought we talked about how to do that through an interim management plan and also thinking about how do we maintain the operations of your CRC throughout. Big action-packed episode today. Let's talk about what we're gonna focus on. So I'm gonna cover a couple of critical areas for you. First one, we just wanna go back and reinforce the value of a succession plan, why you should do it, and why you should actually get it down on paper and share it with others. We'll also talk about some practical ideas to help you through the process and work you through the next steps. And most importantly, we're gonna cover our top five life-changing tips to help you deal with and implement your succession plan. So John, you ready for this? Yep. Brilliant, let's go. Okay, the real importance of succession planning is to ensure that the operation of the CRC can continue no matter what, uh, what things are thrown at it. And when you think about it, the CRCs are, are pretty vulnerable to all kinds of things particularly around people, because quite often the CRCs are operating in a small community. There's a small pool of people to draw from, so there's not a whole lot of resource there. So if some key person in the organization leaves uh, unexpectedly then or gets sick, then it can obviously create a major uh, impact on the CRC's operation. So it's about making sure that uh, the bases are covered as much as possible. And the other thing, of course, again, around the people side of things is that, that quite often, um, Andrew says people are moonlighting, but by that he means that uh, people are quite often on other committees as well. And they're probably running their own business or in a, in a business situation. So as well as people being scarce, the ones that are available are quite often very time poor. So again, it's about planning uh, and not taking up too much of people's time so that they can invest some time in, in helping with the CRC. And then of course the other big one with any not-for-profit organisation is the funding. So quite often CRCs will be reliant upon one or two major sources of income and that's a, a big vulnerability. So there needs to be some good strategies around reducing that. So where do you start? So my recommendation is, is that you start by brainstorming and identifying exactly what the risks are. And a good way to do that, and it should be done on a regular basis, is to get the whiteboard of my favourite post-it notes, Andrew, and just get everybody to, to come up with as many things as they possibly can and put them on the whiteboard. And typically what happens in those situations is that as people start to mention things, it prompts ideas in, in other people's minds as well. The other thing with that, once you've identified all the, the risks that you can think of, is then to start prioritising them because some are, uh, I guess, more likely than others and they need to be dealt with in order of priority and I'll explain a little bit more about how to do that in a moment. And then of course none of this is any good unless you take action or have an action plan in place to uh, mitigate some of the, the risks and vulnerabilities of the CRC. So anything you want to add, Andrew, before I move on to the prioritising? I really like that last point, John, because I, I think having done that actually helps give people a, a, a sense of relief, actually, a sense of calm that they know what's coming at them and have got something in place to actually deal with it. And I find myself when I'm starting to think that, oh, things are just starting to get a bit out of my hand or that I'm having trouble to be managing a lot of things that I've got coming my way. If I just sit down and have some quiet time and like you did, get the post-it notes, put them up, and then think, okay, well, these are the actual actions I've got to put in place. 
once I've got them in place, it's actually feeling, all right, I've got some control over this now and I can just schedule those in to make sure it happens. And for me, that really helps turn something that was a real anxiety for me into thinking, oh yeah, this is not so bad. This is, I can do that. And I can think of the ones I'm going to do and some of the ones I might delegate to other people. I've got some work coming your way on that one, by the way. <laughs> okay. Yes, that's fantastic. I mean, you're really removing some of the stress and worry if you know that you've got a good uh, plan in place and you've got some good systems and procedures to follow. So let's just have a look and uh, work out how we tackle, what, what order should we tackle things in, what uh, should we put at the top of the, the planning as far as the vulnerabilities go and the risks. So again, using those post-it notes uh, that you put up on the whiteboard, draw this, this grid. So you talk about the impact of a particular vulnerability or risk, talk about the likelihood of it happening. So to go back to the the people issues that we were talking about, you know, if, if you are in a small community, as which most CRCs are, and you've got people on the board with particular skills, uh, then that is probably quite a high risk in that if it's there going, it's going to impact on the uh, performance of the CRC, then it needs to go in the high impact, high likelihood quadrant. So move all your post-it notes that come into that category into that quadrant. Then you'll have some things which are obviously a, a high impact, but the likelihood of them occurring is, is pretty low. So some of those things could be natural disasters, uh, so fire, flood, earthquake, all those kind of things. So the likelihood's not very high, but the impact would be significant. So move all of those across into quadrant two. Then you will have some things that are, are more likely to happen, so maybe coming and going of some staff members and things like that. But again, the impact may not be that great, particularly if you've planned for that and you've got other people that can step in and take over. And then finally, you'll have some things which are uh, low impact and low likelihood, and they go into the fourth quadrant in the bottom left-hand corner, and they're the things you can afford to, to leave a little bit longer before you start uh, putting your action plans into place. So for me that's a really nice, simple and clear way of prioritising which risks and vulnerabilities to address first. Andrew, anything to, to add to that? I, I just love the pragmatism of that model. It, it's, it's either one or it's the other, so there's none of this sitting on the fence type of thing. And again, when you, when you get those things that sit in that quadrant four, to me it just helps get rid of some of the clutter in, in your work. So then you can just really go on and move on with the stuff that really matters and not get overwhelmed by all the things that could possibly go wrong or possibly be a challenge. So to me, I think it's, it's a great model for just giving you focus in what you're doing. Yeah, that's right. And you know, in a perfect world, you'd have everything covered off. <laughs> but um, in this not so perfect world, then you really need to start with the highest priorities first. So that's the first tip is look at the risks, the vulnerabilities, and then prioritise them and develop some action plans. So Andrew, tip two. I'm taking it straight from you, John. Tip number two is always be recruiting. And um, you and I both were champion football players, of course, and I think we get better each year since we've stopped playing. Um, and I think with that analogy, I'd, that's where I'm gonna go with this one, in always be recruiting, is to think of yourself almost as, as a football coach or perhaps a basketball coach thinking of this or of your team going into the pre-season and just put yourself into the mindset of um, what are the skills I really need on my team coming into the next season and I understand that you know CRCs that we do have a, often a limited pool of people to recruit from but I think it is really worth thinking about who is on my team what skills do they possess and what I really need on there so to me it's actually stepping back from looking at um, the people there and just thinking about um, what are the skills I'm going to need there? Like I've got some wonderful people, I like them, all that kind of thing and we get along well but what skills do they actually have and to really stop and think about that and work through it. So do some assessment of that and, and John's talked about in, in previous episodes and, and in and other programs about using that, that skills matrix to help you do that. So really start to get the, get the um, magnifying glass out and think quite seriously about, well, 
what are the skills we're going to need perhaps in the next three years moving forward to make sure our CRC functions effectively. And one of the things that uh, Jodie Neal brought up when, when she was on in some of the early episodes was looking in the hidden places for new talent. And we're here in AFL that we're seeing a lot of international recruits come in, that they're bringing skills from, from other games. And, and in, in Jodie's um, at Boy Up Brook, they, they actually brought a high school student onto their, uh, onto their committee. And, and that just brought a whole new freshness, a, a new view, new look at life, new ideas. And, and for some CRCs, uh, some people would be freaking out about that. You know, what can, a, what can a young person help me with? But in this case, it was just fantastic for them. It brought uh, new ideas and a new set of eyes and really helped that group to think about, well, where do we take this from here? John? The boards you've been on, how, how have you gone about looking at that? Where are those hidden talents? Where do you find them? Yes, it's interesting, Andrew. Obviously, we tend to explore local businesses for some good, smart business people that we can bring into the uh, board. And there's other things you can do as well. I know in small communities, again, uh, talking about that, you've got less people to draw on, but you can form a relationship with, um, for example, real estate businesses and find out you know, if people are moving to town, if people are moving away. So you get some idea of new people entering into the community. Obviously there may be some privacy issues and things there, but at least if the real estate people can mention the CRC to, to people, then you know, you're starting to create that awareness and, uh, and some contacts. And again, the local council is a good um, opportunity to, to find out if people are starting up new businesses or new businesses are coming to town because obviously they have to register and things like that. So there are sources of information and sources where you can find out what's happening uh, with people moving in and moving out of the town. So it's use your imagination, uh, think about who's going to have the knowledge that you want and even introduce people via video. Andrew, that's something we've talked about in other episodes as well. So you could even whether it was temporarily or in a permanent situation, have someone who was maybe a little bit more remote to the community, but who could come into meetings uh, via video. We, we had a board meeting yesterday and one of the board members was in India and one of the other board members was in Sydney. But through the use of technology, we were able to have our meeting and uh, have a quorum and make some decisions. I also understand that a lot of communities now are having or still having the community welcomes, where for new people coming to town, they have a almost like a reception for a group of people that are coming to town. Australia Day celebrations, I think it's another one, opportunity where you've probably got people who are being introduced that may not have been so active. So there's the opportunity there, or even the Australia Day Awards, I think for another opportunity for CRCs just to get out there, meet some people that may not come in through the CRC and have a chat and find out a bit about their skills and what they might be doing. I'd also be keeping an eye on um, who's retiring, if they're moving out of their business, perhaps there's an opportunity to keep them involved in a meaningful way in, in helping their community that way. So to me, I think there's a number of opportunities that you can just keep looking under those hidden places for people that can help bring the CRC along, either in official capacity or an unofficial capacity. So John, as you say, there's, there's always real value in looking in those hidden places for new talent. Yes, that's right. Uh, there's more places you can look and get information from than quite often you, you, you know or believe. So brainstorm some of those ideas. I think it's time to talk about our big tip number three to unveil that, which is about using systems. John, you're a system man. You're Mr Black and White. Can you take us through that, please? <laughs> um, systems is one of my favourite topics in business. Um, it's quite often an area where businesses fall down and not for profit. So any organisation really needs good systems and, and processes in place. And systems is an acronym, believe it or not. And it's not a TLA, it's not a three letter acronym. It's a six letter one. But it stands for save you stress, time, energy and money. And I think that uh, really reinforces why you, you need systems. But let's think about what sort of things you can systemize or why you should systemize. I mean, one of the great benefits of systemizing any organization, any business, is that it means that people can come in and out of the, the business or organization into the CRC and know how to do things. So they can be trained up quickly to follow the system and 
the other great benefit about having systems is that you're now coming up with a, a consistent way of delivering a service or a product. So even if we take it as simple as something like making a cup of coffee, Andrew, which I know is something close to your heart. You betcha. But at home I've got an, an espresso machine and when I'm making a coffee, I go through a particular system. And the reason I do that is because I want to get a consistently good cup of coffee out of that machine. And then when we are finished with the coffee, I've got a system that I follow for cleaning the machine. So for taking it apart, cleaning it, uh, and putting it back together ready for the next use. So Andrew, I know that's something pretty close to your heart in your cafe business. How do you do things there? Well, I think you've hit the nail really on the head there, John, because a lot of people ask us, oh, who's your number one barista? But it's important for us to have a number of people who can make a really good coffee each time. And so for a CRC perspective, it's important to have, to me, a number of people who can perform a specific service. So we make sure that, that our staff, we've got probably two or three people who can make a really good consistent coffee each time by following pretty much John's process. They've gone through it. They know that these are the key steps that have to be followed each and every time or there's going to be trouble. <laughs> and the trouble's going to be a bad coffee and there's nothing worse than being the person who's provided somebody with a bad coffee. So I think it's, it's a really good move that everyone under, A, understands what's required B has been taken through the steps and C sees the value in what it provides as well, not only to the, the joy they bring to somebody through a beautiful coffee in the morning, but also in having some pride in what they do as well. Absolutely, Andrew, and I've never had a, a bad cup of coffee of food for me, so it obviously works. The other thing about systems is that they don't have to be complicated. Quite often the reason people don't put systems in is because they believe that they've got to write up lengthy manuals and documents and things like that. But systems can be um, implemented and documented in many different ways. A simple little flowchart is a good way for documenting some things. Um, it, it can be really as simple as that. So think about what can be systemized in the CRC. Anything which is a repetitive task that's repeated over and over again. And start with the areas of the greatest pain. So things that um, cause people stress and a, a classic one, Andrew, and you may have some input on this in a moment, is uh, finding information and finding data. In episode three we talked about data and information management and that's a great place to start s systemizing. The thing about documents and information and data is, and I find this in businesses as well, it still amazes me the amount of time that gets wasted with people trying to find information. You know, just because they don't have a simple um, standard or policy of how they name documents, where they put information, who has access to it and things like that. So it, it's not rocket science, you know, it's find a, a place to put the information, decide on who's going to have access to what information and then designate responsibility for somebody to manage that. Andrew. I think it's also important there to be thinking about when you design those systems to think oh, who are going to be the users of those systems and, and we did talk about back in episode three in terms of think about all the, the multiple users we've got of, of a CRC, we've got, um, we've got our staff, we've got committee members, we've got volunteers coming there as well as clients and, and we've also got a variety of I guess ages and, and experience in using different forms of technology and you mentioned there in the access, well there's there's going to be some things that some people just don't need to get to. Maybe it's just a coordinator needs to have access to that. And so, so to me it's thinking about A, there's the obvious part where some of it's um, on, the, on the computer system, but there could be ones where, John, you alluded to you like your, your flow chart or your, or your folder of information, or um, I think it was Jody mentioned in, in previous episodes that they're, they're using video and that type of thing. So it could be as simple as having mapped out your printing or photocopy procedure using your iPad or tablet and have a little video and so if mm. a volunteer comes in and needs to do that sort of work they can just basically um, watch the video, go through that, they can go and check out the folder with the information in place. So it, I guess it relates to people's own learning styles as well. So to me it's thinking about not only where does the information need to be but who are the users of it and what's their preference for, 
for grabbing information. And of course the other the reason this is, comes up in succession planning as well is that it makes it very easy for bringing new people into the organisation at whatever level if they've got systems to follow. So part of the induction process would be to train them on the systems and processes and how to find all that information. So can't emphasise enough how important it is to have systems and um, have them well documented and have somebody manage that whole situation. Just having the last word on systems, John, I think um, having good systems in place, like any business, makes it run, like you said earlier, smoothly. And I think that attracts people if they can go to a place that they know there's, people know what's going on, how it's all working, and there's, a, I guess, it's not, a, not necessarily a sense of inner calm, but they know that it's not going to be a circus when they go there and it's a madhouse. Everything has um, some structure to it. And I think, like if you're selling a business, if, if you know that's got a sense of structure to it, that helps a lot. So if, to me, if I was looking at becoming, say, a volunteer or board member or even joining a CRC as a staff member, knowing that there's some sort of structured approach to the work would be a, a bonus or an attractant to me rather than thinking, oh, well, we'll see what happens on the day. <laughs> yeah, so when people come into the organisation, they know straight away what their role is and what required of them and how to do it. So, uh, so Andrew, I, I can't wait to hear what life-changing tip number four is. <laughs> So please take us into that. Well, it's, this is a, a good segue because we're talking about segues. We're talking about having a, a smooth-ish transition process. And to me, it's, it's thinking about a couple of areas here in terms of um, how do we make sure that we can bring new people into the organisation, into the, into the CRC. And I, I reckon using s subcommittees is a great way to do it because it's possibly some of the care without all the responsibility of being on a... Um, on a, as a board member of the, C, of the CRC. Getting people involved as a non-official member on a subcommittee I think works pretty well. John, you've seen that work in a lot of the boards you've been on. How's it been used? Yes, good point, Andrew. There's a um, situation that I'm involved in at the moment where I'm acting in an advisory capacity to a subcommittee on a board. And that's in relation to um, looking at the staff positions and the personnel that are in, in the organisation. And, you know, it's a great way to get new people involved and to train them up in what's going on in the organisation. So in a CRC situation, you might get somebody from industry or from a particular type of business to come in onto a subcommittee, whether it be financial subcommittee or a succession planning subcommittee, to actually give the benefit of, of their experience. And it could be somebody who uh, doesn't have the time to be a full-time board member, but they're willing to, to give up a bit of their time on an ad hoc type basis. And of course, it's introducing them to the CRC, it's getting them familiar with what's going on, and hopefully somewhere down the track, um, if, if they're the right people for you, then you can introduce them to a more permanent position. I reckon that's, it's a great strategy, because I think if, if you're doing your job well enough, then it can really I guess, as you've mentioned, just provide them, it starts sowing the seed to a fair degree and they start to think, well, you know, there's probably some more I could add to this group or there's some more I could assist them with. And I think that there's nothing stronger than that sense of ego to appeal to people to think, oh, <laughs> we really need your expertise here. So I think that's a really good strategy that, that you've identified in the it's past. It's a bit like a probationary period, not a probationary period, but I mean, you get to know the person, you get to know their personality, their values, and whether they would actually fit in with the CRC culture as well. Yeah, good call. Because there could be some people that thinking, mm, maybe not for the CRC. Mm. It's a, a Try before you buy. Rather, we've also talked about the importance of mentoring and buddying systems, and that can be either with staff or with uh, on the board as well. So they're, they're a good way for for people who are new to the organisation to to have a helping hand, to have an experienced person by their side who can step them through some of the things they're maybe un, uncertain about or to, to help them really think, think through some ideas they're not quite sure on and to, to give them, I guess, some stronger insights into what's happening so they're not always having to question what's going on here, what happened in the past, what are some of the background issues to this. Having somebody like a mentor or a buddy by their side can, can help a lot. Here's one of the things that's uh, important to me. Um, again, coming from a, a, a rural background, I do a lot of work with farmers have a farming family and understand the importance of having what I call the, the test paddock. And, and often when you see 
um, a young son or daughter coming onto the farm, dad often sometimes begrudgingly will hand him over the, the test, what they call the test paddock. And say, well, here we go, young lady, here's your paddock. When it comes to this season, it's up to you to um, decide what crop you want to put in, how you want to manage it, um, when it needs to be sprayed, what's the right time for harvesting, all those type of things. So it really hands over some, some control to somebody coming into, in this case, the farming business. So for a CRC, I think it's worth thinking about what are the test paddocks that you can set up to, to give some um, new projects perhaps or new initiatives or new ideas to new people coming into the CRC that they've got a free reign to go and run with and that there's not going to be major consequences if things fall over. Let's move over to tip number five which is about being open and transparent. John, can you take us through that please? Sure, we talked about this quite a bit in episode four on implementation. It's about being open and honest with everyone, the, the board members, the staff members, about succession planning and what's going on. So everyone needs to know the plan and be involved with it. And then there's no sort of fear or, or misunderstandings about what you're doing and, and why you're doing it. And it, it, again, it's about the chairperson knowing the board members at a personal sort of level in terms of what their goals and aspirations are, to have a, you know, a handle on when people expect to be leaving the board or when they're looking to move into a higher level role and things like that. So it's just like in any business, you need to know what people's individual goals are and if you can align those goals with the, the goals of the organisation then everything's going to run a, a lot more smoothly. The other thing is that um, don't be afraid of people coming and going, whether it be on the board or amongst the staff as well, because as we've talked about in other episodes, the, the refreshing uh, is fantastic. It gets new ideas in. You know, we've had CRC chairs talk about this um, because you get new ideas, you get new skill sets, and it just refreshes and keeps everybody energized and motivated and, and doing more. One of the, just picking up on that, John, um, I remember at one of the mastermind groups that you ran, we had a guy that ran his own business and he said to all the staff, don't expect me to give you a farewell, but I'm going to give you a welcome party. So he really emphasised that the valuing of bringing people in and um, celebrating that, that, I guess, constant reinvigoration of his organisation and his business. So I thought, different approach, probably a bit of fear factor for anybody who was wanting to leave, but <laughs> I think it really just celebrated that we're always here to renew and we always celebrate bringing new people in as well as acknowledging the people that have contributed and moving on. Yes, and there's quite a reluctance sometimes, particularly amongst the, the males on the board or even in a, a management position of not wanting to get too close or understand other people's personal lives too much. But really that's being proven now to be a mistake and research that's been done by Harvard and people like that shows that employees, staff members, team members want the leadership to understand them as a person and be closer to them as a person and understand their personal goals. So again, it's about being open, that's the tip, being honest and getting people comfortable with being able to talk about what their aspirations are and where they're going to be going. You know, try and work on a three-year plan so when you're grooming people to take over as chairperson or treasurer or things like that, um, have it all planned out and, and mapped out. We know that not everything goes according to plan, Andrew. Um, life's what happens to us, you're making your plans. But at least if you've got a plan and you've thought these things through, as you said earlier in this episode, then when things do occur or you do need to uh, make those changes, it's not so stressful because you've thought about it, planned and you've got things in place. There are fantastic five top tips for helping you to think through and now go forward and implement your succession plan. And this is the, the critical part from here on, is to be thinking about where do I take this and working with, my, working with your colleagues to um, make sure you get that plan implemented. So moving forward, our challenge to you is to really start thinking about this is all great to, to have all the theory behind us. Our challenge to you now is to think about making this all happen. So our encouragement is to go back and discuss the program further with your colleagues 
and to really use the workbook that you've got there and MSO to, to make sure you've got good resources to help you implement the plan and, and then just get it down. Get it down on paper, run it by some people who are uh, close to you and making sure people, as John just mentioned, people uh, are clear on it, understand it and, and it's an open process, not something that people should be scared about. So that's it. That's, that's us done and dusted for another fantastic program. Thanks, John. It's been wonderful having you on board again, your expertise that you keep giving and giving and giving again. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. It's always a pleasure, and uh, I love working with you and certainly like, enjoy working with the CRCs and getting involved with them. And a big thank you from, from both of us to uh, Rosworth from DRD for making this happen and making sure that, that you guys out there get every opportunity to, to access resources like this. So it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Thank you.